Hi, everyone. Welcome to Cool Ocean Habitats uh, with Jill Heinert. We are so excited to have her with us today to talk to us about all of her adventures. But before I give Jill a proper introduction, um, I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge that I currently reside on the unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples who have been the guardians of and in relationship with these lands from time immemorial. I invite you all to take a moment to reflect on the land when, where you are living and the history and geography that make up its past, present, and future. So welcome. My name is Jennifer, and I am from the Canadian Geographic Education and the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Uh, and we offer free bilingual resources to support geography education across Canada. So Jill Heinert has joined us today to help us celebrate Ocean Week. Uh, she's going to be taking us into the deep waters of the ocean, where you will be able to hear about her experiences as a cave diver. So we'll have lots of time for questions. So teachers, make sure you have your questions in the chat uh, because we're gonna be checking those throughout the presentation. So if you're joining us on YouTube or Facebook, um, they'll, uh, you can also put your questions in the chat there as well. So if anyone's joining us on YouTube or Facebook, please give us a thumbs up, a heart, a little indication that you're out there because we wanna see who's watching. So feel free to put those in the chat. Also feel free to put where you're joining from. So our, where are you in Canada uh, joining us for this awesome talk on uh, cool ocean habitats. So now I have the pleasure of introducing Jill Heiner, who's a Canadian diver, underwater explorer, writer, photographer, filmmaker, among other amazing things. She has given a much viewed TED talk and she is a climate advocate. And we are lucky to have her as one of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society's explorers in residence. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce everyone to Jill. The floor is yours, Jill. All right, thank you so much. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with you celebrating World Oceans Day. I'm actually calling in from the traditional territory of the Algonquin and Huron-Wendat people. I live near Ottawa, Canada, and grew up in the Great Lakes watershed. So although I didn't grow up beside the ocean, I recognize that I am connected to the ocean, and especially through my work. So today, I'm going to take you on a tour of exciting habitats in all five of the world's oceans and share a little bit about the type of work that I do. As I mentioned, I, I grew up in the Great Lakes and I've always been one to love being outdoors and by the water, frequently cottaging in Northern Ontario on beautiful lakes. Today, my work takes me all around the world, most of the times with a camera in my hand, working to document underwater uh, phenomena, as well as collaborating with scientists in many different disciplines. I can become their eyes and hands in environments that they might not necessarily be able to reach. My diving work takes me to some unusual places, including as far away places where you couldn't imagine there was water, like the Sahara Desert. But there are some pretty incredible dive sites there too. My work has also taken me inside volcanoes, if you can imagine. So there are lots of places where we don't think that there's water, or we don't understand that water connects to the oceans. But I'm going to give you that tour today. My favorite type of diving takes me into underwater cave systems, and I liken these as swimming through the veins of Mother Earth, because I'm in that conduit of water that will serve to refresh a spring, feed a creek, a river, an estuary, and eventually reach its fingers out into the oceans and beyond. So without further delay, let's start our tour. And I'm going to begin in my favorite ocean and what I believe is probably the most important ocean to be studying these days. That's the Arctic Ocean. So let's go to Arctic Bay in Nunavut and see what's there. 
My work has taken me there to be on top of what the Inuit people refer to as the land, because it's the sea ice that freezes up in the winter and thaws in the early summer. That sea ice that connects them to their traditional practices, the hunt, to other communities, because the sea ice is the place that they can travel. And I get to travel on top of the sea ice with my Inuit guides and even camp out in places like this on top of the Northwest Passage. But at other times of year, the sea ice is either setting up or it's breaking apart. And these days, it's getting much thinner and the extents of the frozen surface of the Arctic Ocean is shrinking rapidly because of climate change. Here's another view of the land, um, because as you can see, traveling on that sea ice is a whole lot easier than hiking through these mountains to get to places. When we dive out on top of the sea ice, we sometimes dive um, in uh, places adjacent to these very large icebergs that get trapped in the sea ice. These icebergs actually came from the Greenland ice sheet. They came across the Davis Strait and got locked up in the sea ice here. So these icebergs are travelers bringing biological materials across from Greenland. As I mentioned today, traveling on top of the sea ice has its challenges because it's melting earlier each year and setting up later and it's getting thinner. And today with a warming Arctic, we have a lot more rain. So even though we use skidoos to pull traditional Kamatuk sleds around, um, we're actually camping in some pretty wet conditions. Uh, and that is extremely challenging. There are more people falling through the ice these days when they're going out to hunt and be on the land. And that, uh, that's very worrying because it's changing everything. Now, when we're out on top of the sea ice, sometimes we find little holes that lead to the water. And these are actually created by seals that use these as breathing holes. So they can actually carve their way up to create a hole that they can stick their nose up through to catch a breath. So you'll find that these are grouped around and um, many families of seals will be poking their heads up in different holes to catch a breath and hopefully keep an eye out for predators on top of the sea ice. Underneath the sea ice, we see what is the base of the food chain. So these algal strings are actually growing on the underside of the sea ice, fueled by sunlight. And that sunlight penetrates through the ice and um, brings life to the bottom of the food chain here that's so important to everything else. Sometimes we dive in these natural leads or breaks in the sea ice. And if you see them from below, you can see these are really straight lines. I've seen sometimes on the internet when people go, hmm, what made this very straight line in the ice? And it's like, well, that's just how ice fractures. And as the sea ice starts to break up early in the season, these large leads open up and get wider. And then eventually big pieces of this ice just float off into the ocean and head south on major ocean currents. This is the area that we call the flow edge. So where the sea ice meets the ocean at that boundary line there that changes every day as it breaks up and melts. This is like the buffet zone where all the animals come to feed because the ice is releasing all of these nutrients that feed everything on up through the food chain. So every day the buffet moves along and so do the animals with it. So it's an extraordinary place to capture um, the activities of marine mammals and birds and everything else. Sometimes the flow edge has a very sharp line edge and it's then easy for us to get to the edge, but sometimes it's more of a, a jagged edge and it's a little bit more difficult to get there and it can be thin. But here on a perfect day, my colleague Mario Sear and I can go to the flow edge and see beluga whales and narwhals with their tusks sticking up out of the water. We'll see bowhead whales and seals and all kinds of birds feeding on the bountiful food supply there. And I feel such a privilege to see these very rare and some endangered animals at the flow edge. Now, underneath the ice, again, here's one of these really clear fractures, um, very, very straight line. And that'll give you a sense of the thickness of the ice in this location that's about two meters thick. 
Um, underneath, you can see more of this sheen of algae that will feed the uh, zooplankton, phytoplankton, and on up through the food chain. We see lots of interesting small animals like this particular um, jellyfish that has little sort of vibrating, colorful rainbow-like cilia along its sides. Um, and so as it's moving along, it's kind of the size of a souvenir miniature football um, and it has a great mouth that will open up and uh, eat things. So pretty interesting looking animal. And here's me under the sea ice. You'll notice that I have like a clip that's clipped onto my shoulder there with a big fat rope. And one of my indigenous guides is on top of the ice, a little bit back from the water. We have like a ice screw screwed into the ice and that rope um, is tied to that and, and him so that he can help me if the currents become overwhelming and I need some assistance getting back to where I entered the water. So that tether helps us stay connected. Underneath, a little bit deeper, here I am looking up the side of a face of one of these icebergs that's come across the Davis Strait. And you can see there's all these little sort of scallops, this beautiful texture in the ice. And that's just carved by erosional forces of water and air. So even though this is underwater right now, icebergs actually change shape as they um, melt and they'll roll sometimes, they'll invert, and they'll be carved by the wind, they'll be carved by rain, they'll be carved by waves crashing up against them. And to give you a sense of scale, if you follow my finger ooh, just a little bit further over, there's something that's about that long just off the tip of my finger. And that's my dive buddy. So that's incredible visibility. It's not always this clear because sometimes plankton blooms make it a little more difficult to see, but uh, that's a pretty long distance between the two of us uh, for me to get that shot for scale. But now let me take you just around the corner, right on the Arctic Circle to another interesting place. And this is Nauyat, Nunavut. And we go to this region because it's quite remote, actually in the very northern reaches of Hudson Bay. And we have a chance to encounter some very large animals like the one that made this footprint. So that's my hand in the glove. And this footprint here that goes top to bottom is from a polar bear. And I had a very rare opportunity to swim with wild polar bears in the north in the making of a film for the CBC on the nature of things. It's called Under Thin Ice. You can actually stream that for free on CBC Gem or teachers can get it on Curio in the classroom. So in this part of the Arctic, we go a little bit later and you'll see that the ice cover is gone and we're actually camping on an island, White Island. And uh, we're staying in a small hut because there's so many polar bears, it gives us a little more comfort. This is our dive boat here, a uh, little moose head canoe. And I can tell you that a polar bear is almost as big as this canoe. So it's kind of scary jumping in the water with polar bears. This is our very beautiful camp location. And we um, have indigenous partners that act as our guides, but also as bear guards, because every day we were encountering 16 to 20 polar bears and they're hunters, they're hungry, and they are predating on us. Now, the Inuit guides will use sound to scare away the polar bears, like sometimes just revving the engine of the boat or a snowmobile or using a firecracker or something like that. And if we ever have to fire a gun, it's for the sound to scare the polar bear away uh, because we definitely don't wanna injure a bear if, if at all possible. So here in the North, we see polar bears in the water quite a bit more because of the loss of sea ice. And that's very taxing. They use a lot more energy to swim and hunt for food when they're used to getting it from being on top of the ice and going to something like one of those seal holes I showed you to grab a seal. So this mother and baby, she's teaching them babies that she's teaching them to swim and they can swim great distances, island to island. 
So for Under Thin Ice, I actually jumped in the water um, with a solo uh, polar bear in order to catch some footage from beneath to see the polar bear swimming over our heads. We also got a chances to see these polar bears move from water to land, and they are very nimble, climbing straight up a cliff face, um, sometimes even robbing birds' nests of eggs because they haven't found enough larger protein in order to feed themselves, like a beluga whale or a seal that they would normally feed on. Now you can imagine how many birds or eggs it would take to fill up a polar bear, and that can upset the balance of nature too if they can't access their traditional meals. Also in this part of the world, beyond um, swimming and, and uh, documenting these polar bears, I've had a chance also to swim with walruses. And these amazing animals are fantastic to watch. A walrus will use its tusks to dig in the bottom and get clams and shells and things and eat the meat from inside there. That's why they need those big digging tusks. I've had a chance to see mothers with babies as well. And we know that this is a mother with these two young walruses. The wal young walruses don't have tusks yet, but the mother has tusks that stick out like this. If the tusks stick straight down, um, then it's a male walrus where the girl walruses stick out like this because she cradles her baby when they can't swim fast enough and she nurses her babies. So her tusks stick out like that. They're really beautiful animals to see. But with a little caribou smile, I think I will take you next, following the course of where an iceberg would go. So following the ocean currents from Baffin Island, we then moved down the east coast of Labrador in Canada and passed by beautiful mountainous places like the Torngats, the national park. And as we travel down that coast, we can follow the course of these icebergs. And you can see how this one would have been bobbing up and down because that's what those marks are from. And this iceberg, as it melts and changes shape, at some point will eventually roll or topple. And we see evidence of it happening very slowly because of those horizontal lines you see. So these icebergs continue to be shaped and eroded by the wind, the rain and the ocean and rolling. And they're like beautiful sculptural pieces as we follow them southward along the coast until they eventually melt away. Icebergs often reach down into Newfoundland and they have been seen as far south as Bermuda, if you can imagine. And I'll show you where Bermuda is in a few minutes. And these icebergs still carry a biological wake because they continue to release nutrients into the ocean. And close to icebergs, we see small life, but we also see things like humpback whales. And how amazing it is to see these and listen to these great creatures under the water. Sometimes we even get very close when they swim right past us. In fact, I've even had a very large bull humpback sweep his tail fluke almost over the dome port of my camera. And the next photograph in this series that I don't have, uh, because it was a very bad photograph, because right after this, this very large humpback whale let out an enormous dump. Yes, I said dump, a poop. <laughs> so moments after this, I was swimming through liquid chocolate poop. <laughs> and that um, kind of smelled like something between poop and fish. <laughs> so pretty interesting, but I couldn't see much until he had passed me by. <laughs> so further down beyond Labrador, we get into like the island part of Newfoundland and I can actually take you to Terra Nova National Park another national park in the system. And here we see things like, I can swim inside a bloom of jellyfish. These are absolutely incredible. It's almost like being in a bouncy ball room at Ikea. So these little sort of rubbery feeling things are just kind of bouncing off of me as I'm working my way through millions of moon jellyfish. They're pretty amazing. 
Now the seafloor is also really colorful. There's lots of filter feeding organisms. There's lots of things encrusting the rocks and it looks almost tropical. There's so much life. But the water temperatures here are still about minus 1.8 Celsius. So one tenth of a degree colder and it would actually be frozen. Sometimes in the summer we get slightly warmer temperatures, but since the currents come from the north and go south, we get cold Arctic waters that come down in this direction. But it's so interesting to see an animal like an anemone here. His mouth is kind of like in between where my hands are hitting and he uses those fingers to grab things and then stuff them into his mouth so that's pretty neat and he attaches himself to a rock even though he's an animal he's a stationary animal that's kind of locked onto the rock now let's continue to follow our ice and you'll see that it's been sculpted some more like there's some pretty cool grooves maybe carved by um, waves or the fact that this is kind of slowly rotating itself so these are endangered species in and of themselves because once they melt away, we don't see them anymore. So every time I get to dive with icebergs, I think it's really beautiful to watch as they're being shaped even through the course of a day. Because the further south I go, like as I reach like the island of Newfoundland, it's warmer and they're melting faster. We can hear them cracking and popping and fizzing as they're releasing bubbles from the ice both topside and underwater. Sometimes they're even like hitting off the ocean floor. And when they do that, they send silt and ice um, upward towards the surface. We can even see them fizzing bubbles and releasing um, things that were trapped in the snow from 10,000 or even 100,000 years ago when it snowed back in Greenland to create this iceberg that's made it to Canada. But as I mentioned before, I know I never get tired of taking pictures of the ice because it's so interesting and beautiful to see. Some of these carved furrows are probably carved by the bubbles that are moving upward. And as they do, they're kind of eroding the ice in the process. So sometimes after a dive, when we get back into our boat, we even pick up a few loose pieces of ice that have been floating around and we take those back so that we could put them in our soda pop at the end of the day. And uh, it's interesting fizzing ice. And it's again, letting out that ancient atmosphere um, from many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years ago. So after the ice, um, melts in the early spring and summer in Newfoundland, there's some other things that we dive there as well because there's some beautiful, beautiful landscapes. There are also shipwrecks beneath the surface. These shipwrecks were sunk in 1942 by German U-boats. And as well as being like important historical sites and war graves, these are also artificial reefs because things in the ocean recruit and um, bond to things like the metal of shipwrecks. So shipwrecks are a magnet for life in the ocean and they're very colorful. This is the stern of a ship with a large defensive deck gun and the entire deck gun is just covered with anemones and corals and it's beautiful now. Some of the wrecks have these plumos anemones on them that just open up on a sunny day and the entire wreck looks like puffy and white. We see some larger jellyfish in these places too, and uh, they're really interesting to watch them sort of pulsing and move through the water. Now I'm gonna stay in the Atlantic Ocean, but I'm gonna take you a little bit further away to Iceland so that you can see what it's like in the North Atlantic on Iceland, because we go to a very interesting dive site here. This dive site inside Thingvellir National Park in Iceland is something called Silfra Crack. This is a gap in between the tectonic plates. So when I go underwater here and stretch out my arms, you can see it's not a very wide crack, but it's separating. The tectonic plates are separating here. And I can put one hand on North America and one hand on the Eurasian plate. And when I'm underwater, I'm literally swimming between two continents in that dividing line. So the water's incredibly clear here, very beautiful. 
Now, I'm going to go a little bit south, but still in the Atlantic Ocean, and take you to the Azores Island, which are really in the middle of nowhere. These ancient volcanic seamounts that are actually part of the country of Portugal. And on Santa Maria Island there, I dive with mobile arrays, these giant, beautiful rays. And um, they're bigger than like two arm spans of me. These are enormous. And you can see they have some interesting hitchhikers aboard. These remora fish um, will attach themselves to things like these mobile arrays and they'll catch everything that falls out of the mouth of the mobile, mobile array. So they're one of the garbage collectors of the sea. But let's start to move south in the Atlantic and have a quick peek at Bermuda. Okay, Bermuda, again, is really in the middle of nowhere out in the Atlantic Ocean on top of an ancient volcanic seamount. So here I dive in caves. I also dive offshore in Bermuda, but the caves are so beautiful I had to share a picture of this. And there's even life inside the caves. There's very interesting, uniquely adapted crustaceans that live inside underwater caves. And Bermuda is a real biological hotspot for some of these amazing animals that never see the sunlight. They have venomous fangs and pincers, and they're very, very ancient animals. But let's continue south down into the Caribbean and have a quick peek at a place called Holbosch in Mexico. So this is off the northern tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. And here I get to spend some time with some other great ocean inhabitants, the whale sharks. Now these are sharks, but there's no reason to be afraid of sharks, especially these ones, because they don't have any teeth. These are giant vacuum cleaners that just suck up fish in a big school. They let the water flow out through their gills and eat the fish. And frequently they have remoras hanging around as well because the remoras will attach themselves like you can see one on the flipper on the side there um, on its fin. Um, and this one is looking like it's positioning and getting ready to stick itself underneath the mouth of the whale shark so it can collect um, whatever the whale shark misses. And here's the whale shark actually sort of vacuuming up some fish and plankton very close to the surface. So these are beautiful animals to swim with, to snorkel with. And this photo actually looks like it's trying to suck up my dive or my snorkeling buddy Caroline here, <laughs> but it's just an optical illusion. She's on the far side of that whale shark trying to look and see what he's doing. Now I'm gonna jump from the Atlantic Ocean over the, to the Pacific and share a few images from Canada's West Coast. This is a Puget Sound king crab, very colorful animal that he's well camouflaged because the entire ocean floor in um, the Salish Sea off British Columbia is very colorful. And there's a lot of animals that seem to have no fear of us and they like to come really close. There's a lot of encrusting life like strawberry anemones and urchins all over the sea floor and that attracts a lot of other life. And I like to note that even these spiny urchins are quite beautiful and colorful. There's a lot of interesting um, life, like these tube worms. Um, so these little calcareous stalks, like they're kind of hard rock-like stalks, will actually bloom a little filter feeding organism that will grab things. Um, and then these are all little filter feeding um, anemones as well that are grabbing things out of the water that we can hardly even see. But I also dive with big stuff in uh, this part of the world, um, stellar sea lions and California sea lions. And uh, these guys are so playful. They're very, very curious. And they usually swim right up to us. They'll even sort of sit on our heads or pull on things. Like I've had them steal the fins right off of my buddy. I've even played catch with a sea lion that brought me a small rock that I sort of threw away and it brought it back to me again. So uh, these are pretty, uh, pretty cool uh, residents kind of like a big pack of playful puppies that like to sort of teeth on everything on your gear, but they never hurt us. So that's a really, really fun thing to do. 
Now let's jump over to the other side of the Pacific Ocean and we're going to go to a place called Chuuk in the Federated States of Micronesia. So this is a lot further south, the water's a lot warmer and we have a very different habitat. We also have shipwrecks and in these shipwrecks, um, this, these were actually sunk in World War II as well. We have life both inside the shipwrecks, living off of the iron of the shipwrecks, and we have a lot of life on the outside of the shipwrecks and on all of the um, archaeological remains that are there. Like these are gas masks lying on a shipwreck, and then there's all kinds of things that are growing on the gas masks now. Um, here is a deck gun uh, or, or and uh, a windlass actually on the deck of a ship and there's things just growing all over it. Even on the ship's wheel itself, the wooden wheel, the wood has actually um, been basically dissolved back into the sea or eaten by worms, but the metal remains and that gets coated uh, by all sorts of different encrusting life. So these places are, again, beautiful artificial reefs. We see things growing on the substrate, but we also see like fish filling some of these spaces. So you wouldn't even know that that's part of a shipwreck necessarily. There's so much life on it and so much color. It's almost distracting. This is again, a deck gun um, with all sorts of growth on it and all sorts of fish around it. So very, very beautiful beautiful environments and I could swim all day long around the outside of these shipwrecks in order to see what's growing on them. So now we're going to hop over and go to the Indian Ocean to a place called Christmas Island which is another national park that's part of the Australia National Park system even though Christmas Island is much closer to Indonesia than Australia. Now here we dive in caves, we crawl into the ground on top of the island and we get into cave systems where we can then get into the water and then move from inland, swim through these cave systems and serve our, survey our way all the way out to the ocean. Now, these reefs at Christmas Island, um, it's so remote that these are very, very well protected. And this is what a healthy coral reef should look like. It's not all covered with stringy algae. There's a vibrant, colorful, dense marine life and a healthy fish population. This is where lionfish are supposed to live. <laughs> they're native to this region where they're invasive in the Atlantic Ocean. So we see a few of them here, um, all cooperating uh, on the coral reef habitat. Now, finally, I need to take you to the last, the fifth ocean on the planet, the Southern Ocean. And I've shown a map here that might sort of twist the world on its head in a way. So now we're looking at Antarctica from below. For me to travel to Antarctica, it takes me um, almost uh, 48 hours to travel all the way around to get to New Zealand. Um, and then from New Zealand, I made a 12 day boat voyage to the Ross Sea uh, on one particular um, expedition. So the Ross Sea is at the bottom here. There are faster ways to get to Antarctica. Like you can see that South America reaches down and like tries to touch the edge of the Antarctic Peninsula. So if you left by boat from the bottom tip of South America, you could get to Antarctica in 24 to 36 hours across the ocean. So you'll also note that the Southern Ocean rings around Antarctica. So you could literally swim a lap around Antarctica, it would take a long time, but the whole ocean um, envelops that terrestrial place. So there's land underneath that ice. And I was, uh, I led a team to be the first people to cave dive inside any iceberg. Um, and this happened to be the largest iceberg in recorded history down in Antarctica. And where the iceberg got tripped up on the seafloor, we found some remarkable colonies of life, more filter feeding organisms and lots of color, lots of current flowing through the icebergs and even animals swimming in tunnels inside the icebergs like these amphipods. So that was one of the most interesting ocean environments that I've ever had a chance to swim through. 
again, a beautiful place. And I could talk all day about the other life that we've had a chance to see in Antarctica. But really right now, I'd rather kind of open this up and give you guys a chance to ask some questions. Now, I know um, that Jen's gonna help orchestrate some of these questions, but if at the end of the day, you didn't get a chance to ask some burning question, then you can always reach out to me at my website at intotheplanet.com and send me a message or a picture or a story or something that inspires you about the ocean. But I think right now we'll go for some questions. So take it away, Jen. Thank you so much, Joe. That was amazing. I know that I learned a lot of things about the ocean and about your experiences in the ocean and some of the animals and the plants in the ocean. It was, that's amazing uh, to see that because we don't always get to see those things. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was great. Um, so we're going to go to questions. Uh, please feel free to write them in the chat on uh, YouTube or Facebook. So we also have some teachers joining as well um, in our own platform. So get your questions ready from your classrooms as well. I'll bring you in in a minute. But we're going to start from YouTube and Facebook. So mm -hmm. keep coming in with those questions. The first one that a lot of people seem to be asking. So. Jill, what is the deepest ocean that you have been in? Ooh, well, the deepest spot in the ocean is Challenger Deep. And you might have seen some very incredible um, submarine trips that people like James Cameron or Victor Vescovo have guided to that very, very deep spot. I haven't been to, <laughs> to Challenger Deep as much as I would love to in the Pacific. Um, the deepest that I've dived down is in Bermuda about 140 meters beneath the surface. But I've also swam like more than three kilometers into the branching conduits of a cave system. So three kilometers in a space like with a roof over my head that I have to come out of before I can go up. <laughs> Great question. Great, thank you. Um, another question for uh, from online is, um, how did you know that this is what you wanted to do? Wow, great question. When I was a little kid, I just loved being in the water. I loved watching Jacques Cousteau on TV and I envisioned that I would be a diver when I grew up. Now, none of my family dived and their reaction was, oh honey, it's cold in the water in Canada. And, and you know, people don't dive here, they thought, right? Um, so I kind of had to chase my own dream. But what I want to tell you is that wherever you live in the world, there are resources that are available to you and you can start diving. So, um, you know, even if you live in Alberta and you feel like I'm a long way from the ocean, there's a really active diving community in Alberta. There's even like um, the Alberta Underwater Council that helps like get people involved in diving and water cleanups and things like that. So wherever you live, there are opportunities. And when you're 10 years old, you can start your journey in diving. And if you're younger, you can still snorkel and swim and get ready to become a diver. Great, yes, good questions coming in. All right, we're gonna go to our teachers who, are, who have joined us on our own platform. So um, we're gonna go to Ms. Digney's class first. Uh, so make sure that you're unmuted and that you've got your microphone ready to go. So feel free to ask her. Hi there. Uh, my students were pretty amazed by all the pictures. They were in the chat commenting on how incredible your experiences are. A lot of them had more specific questions about the different uh, animals that you've been able to interact with. Um, sorry, I'm just going back to what they, they had said. They were asking about um, uh, like the jellyfish, was it dangerous to be with them? And one of them were asking about the whale shark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the jellyfish that you see here are called moon jellies and they don't have a sting that's strong enough to hurt me. Um, so they can catch a fish, a small fish and, and uh, sort of neutralize it and, uh, and eat it. 
there were a few what we call lion's mane jellyfish. They're like bright red and you know, like bright red stop signs, you know, well, bright red jellyfish are like, stop. You don't want to get close to those tentacles because they can sting you. Um, so I was a little nervous when I jumped in here because I knew there were a few lion's manes around. Um, but then I just like, dissolved into giggling. It was so much fun. <laughs> now, most of the time when we see large animals like whales or sharks or anything, we never chase them, right? Because that would be harassing harassing them. We try sometimes to put ourselves in their pathway. And if they want to swim over us, they can. And some of them just steer away. Because most of the time, animals in the water will run away from people. They're scared of you. They're scared of the sound of bubbles. But some of the equipment that I wear is silent. Um, it's a special life support device that doesn't make bubbles. And when I wear that, the animals come right up to me and they're like, hmm, who are you? <laughs> we haven't seen one of you before, but I'm not on their diet. I'm not part of the food chain. And um, so usually it's a meeting of curiosity that I'm excited about. Like I would say that 99% of the time when I see sharks and I get to see sharks a lot, they're swimming away from me and I'm going, hey, wait, take me to your leader. <laughs> I wanna see you. Great, awesome questions coming in. All right, so in the next group that we have from our uh, own platform is uh, Miss Prince's class. Just make sure if you can put on your video and unmute, mm. I'm gonna bring you on. Hi, Jill. Hi. Wow, what an awesome job you have, I must <laughs> say. <laughs> um, I think uh, my kids have lots of questions, but I think the one that keeps popping up the most is about, um, have you ever been in a situation where you have, um, uh, you know, run low on oxygen or, or how long can you stay mm -hmm. under those kinds of questions? Sure, yeah. Yeah, well, my longest underwater mission was 22 hours, but most of my dives are between one and three hours. I've never run out of the gas, and the reason why is because I'm very, very careful. We have something called the rule of thirds, where we'll use one third for me, one third for um, getting home, and one third for emergencies, or to get my dive buddy home. So we're very conservative. We train a lot, we bring the right equipment, we bring lots of extra life support gases. Now, cave diving, is a very dangerous support and sport and it requires a lot of extra backup you know because there's a lot that can go wrong and you're not in a position where you can just swim back to the surface because you're all the way inside a cave so we have even stricter training protocols and safety rules um, with our dive buddies so that we can always handle emergencies underwater thanks great um, I'm going to go to um, online again, so we'll have a look on uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube, so please keep your questions coming in. There's a lot of similar questions, so uh, one of the other ones that I had written down was, um, which ocean habitats have seen the most regression due to climate change? Mm. Wow, that's, that's a really, really thoughtful question. Um, when I started diving, I spent a lot of time in the Caribbean. So in places like the Cayman Islands and the Bahamas. And um, I've noticed a really significant degradation of the coral reefs and the fish populations in the Caribbean. Um, so I've been teaching diving for over 30 years now. And I know that sounds like a long time to some young people here on the call, but really that's a short amount of time to see so many changes. So. I've seen um, a, a lot of life die. I've seen more algae on the reefs. I've seen coral bleaching from the warming waters and the fish populations uh, migrate and, and move. Uh, so it, it's, it's disturbing to me. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the most impact area on earth. It's just the place that I've gone back to over and over again for so many years. I mean, we still know a lot more about space than we do about our deep ocean environments. And so my hope today is that I'm going to inspire a lot of you to become water and ocean scientists and engineers in the future so that you can help us to um, see what's happening from these changes of global, 
global climate change and hopefully come up with some big ideas and solutions to protect these important environments. Because the ocean is the lungs of our planet. So the organisms within the ocean are actually creating a good part of the air that you breathe, the oxygen that you breathe. So healthy oceans mean healthy air, mean healthy people, wildlife, and everything else. They're really important. That's great. It's a very good message and one we should all think about. Um, good. So we're going to bring in another one of our classrooms. So. Uh, Mrs. Jayram's class, Jayram's class, grade four. If you guys want to unmute and put your video on, we'll add you in. Well, um, our question was, uh, what is the coolest thing you've seen uh, diving? And I had a couple kids ask, um, have you ever swam with a blue whale? Ah, thank you. I haven't swam with a blue whale yet. <laughs> Many other species of whale, but not a blue whale yet. That would be absolutely fantastic. Um, boy, it's really tough always to pick like the most amazing thing I've seen underwater because I pinch myself. I see amazing stuff all the time. I mean, right now in the last year, I've been learning a lot about um, a cave system that's near my house. It's the longest underwater cave system in Canada. And although it's a freshwater environment, the freshwater from these caves in the Ottawa River flow into the Ottawa River and down to the St. Lawrence and all the way out to the sea. So we recognize that connectivity of everything that's living in these places. And I've been looking at freshwater mussels that I think are incredible. These freshwater mussels need fish to help them reproduce. They have a host relationship. So a shell, like a freshwater mussel shell, it can be 80 or even 100 years old. And a female mussel will build out of her own flesh something that looks like a tiny fish. And she flicks that fish in the current to attract something like um, a bass or a sturgeon that will nip at this lure that she makes out of her own flesh. And when she nips at the lure, the mussel sprays its young. They're called glochidia. They're like miniature microscopic shells. And they go boop, 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 boop. And they latch onto the gills and the flesh and the fins of the fish. Then the young fish carries those babies around for a few weeks or a little bit longer until her immune system goes, ooh, what's this? And kicks them out. And those tiny little microscopic shells bury themselves in the silt. And then for a couple of years, they live there until they reemerge as juveniles and continue to grow through that life cycle. So they work with fish to help them reproduce. And the mussels themselves filter millions of gallons, millions of liters of water and clean out the water of things like they, they eat um, plankton, but they also will clean things that are dangerous from the water and collect those. So they, they give us a really important ecosystem service, a service that helps the Ottawa River, but it helps the watershed all the way to the ocean. I think they're amazing. <laughs> wow, that is amazing. That would be amazing to see. Yeah. All right, we have a classroom that's gonna be joining us next. So Hillhurst, I hope you guys are ready. We're adding you in, unmute yourself, please. You, I see your video, but uh, awesome. All right, here we go. Make sure you're unmuted. Hi, I'm a grade six student from Hillhurst School. And my question is to become a professional diver, is there any other job or level of education you need to dive safely and effectively? Oh, thank you. Uh, so you might be surprised to know that I studied fine arts in university. So uh, today we live in such a different world where, you know, I work with many different scientists and I learn about lots of different scientific disciplines, but I learn those from my collaborating partners. I learn those from things online, but my formal studies in university were in visual communications and design. So in art, right? Um, but if you want to fast track a career in something to do with the underwater world, you can do that from almost any angle. So you can become an engineer, you could become a medical doctor that services the diving industry and um, works in like hyperbaric, um, so pressure related medicine 
you could be a marine biologist, you could be an ecologist, you could be a chemist, um, or you could even be a commercial diver. So there's many different paths uh, to, to be what you want to be. And for me, I have like a hybrid career. I'm a writer, I'm a photographer, I'm a cinematographer, I'm a researcher, a collaborator, a test pilot, a speaker, an educator, all of those things. And maybe your careers in the future are going to be a little bit more like the career that I have, one that's a whole bunch of different things rather than one specialty in life. And that's served me well, um, especially in times like COVID when, when the work environment really changed and many of my expeditions and projects kind of disappeared. Then I just sort of worked my way back into more writing and presenting during COVID times. So um, pretty much any talent or interest you have, you can also apply to the underwater world. Wow, very inspiring. So keep studying everyone and, and maybe you can uh, join Jill someday on one of her dives. <laughs> and you um, know what, I, I failed to mention that the one encompassing um, avenue of study is actually geography. <laughs> so geography knits us all together. It knits the artists with the scientists and makes relatable public policy and uh, protects our oceans for the future too. So geography is kind of that catch all. If you're like me and you wanna do a lot of things, if I went back to school again, it would be in geography. Great, good, we'd love to have you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our, our, our last streaming group, and then if we have another uh, minute or two, we can uh, maybe go for a last question from YouTube and Facebook, so keep asking those questions. But the, uh, we're gonna go to Sherwood, Sherwood School, so make sure you guys are unmuted and that you're, you know, see your videos working, so make sure you have your question ready, Sherwood. Here we go. Have you ever rescued an animal on your... Oh, how interesting. Yes, um, I have uh, rescued animals. Uh, there are times when we encounter what we call ghost nets underwater. So it's sometimes when fishing boats lose their fishing gear, like very large nets, those can get caught on the seafloor or get caught on a shipwreck. And even though that net is no longer attached to a fishing boat, it continues to catch things. So I've released a turtle, for instance, from a ghost net. I've pulled fish out of ghost nets and set them free. And I've helped to collect ghost nets off the bottom because even just like laying on the bottom, even if you found a towel laying on the bottom on the reef, that could be suffocating in a colony of animals. So I do cleanups quite often, both in my local watershed here and in the ocean. And when we do cleanups, we bring trash out of the sea, but we make sure that we liberate all the animals that are like living inside a bottle or something <laughs> or, um, uh, or anything else. Uh, so yeah, I, I've actually rescued a, a lot of things in the water. Uh, also on the boat, we've had things hop up on the side of the boat and birds land on the side of the boat out of exhaustion. And sometimes they'll ride all the way home with us and then they'll you know, fly away when they're close to land. <laughs> Great, well, that's wonderful. I, I think we're gonna uh, start to do a little bit of our wrap up here. Mm -hmm. And I wanna say, first of all, thank you so much, Jill, for joining us. Uh, I learned a lot. I hope everyone out there learned as much as I did. It was amazing. Um, before I want to, uh, before I come back to you again for a, a final word, what I like to do is I'd like to say thank you to all of you who are joining us today. All the listeners, the teachers, the students, the parents, the guardians, everyone who's out there who's joined us. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Canadian Geographic uh, education, you can find us on uh, social media. You can also find us on our, our website. If you'd also like to learn more about Jill, uh, I'm gonna put a little banner here at the bottom. Um, there we go. So that's her website, intotheplanet.com. So feel free to uh, contact her there and learn more about her amazing experiences. Um, I also wanted to mention for Ocean Week, we are running a competition online. So if you're on social media, Twitter, Facebook, um, and you're a teacher or a parent, you have to be over 18 in order to be on our contest. But uh, we have questions online, so your students can help you answer those questions. And you will get a chance to win a copy of Jill's Into the Planet book. 
if you answer the question correctly. So please check us out there. So Jill, again, thank you. Uh, I'd like to bring you back in for any final words, any final thoughts uh, uh, that you wanna share with uh, everyone today. Thanks. Really the final message that I want to, to leave with you is that wherever you live, the ocean begins beneath your feet. And if we can just look back at this COVID year and remind ourselves that you know, one small virus that started on the other side of the planet affected the entire globe. I want you to think of your oceans that way too, that everything that we do, um, everything that we do on the surface of the land can soak into the ground and be returned to us to drink. It can affect the health of our oceans, the lungs of the planet. And it's really important for us all to learn about that, to explore it and enjoy these beautiful water environments, but also protect them for future generations. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. We'll see you again next time. Bye.